I'm Adam. I'm uh, a PhD student um, at MIT, um, and this is Justice on the Brain. So I want to start with the fact that the criminal justice system is built on views of the brain and behavior, whether we're talking about responsibility or recidivism. Um, these are questions that brain science can lend answers to, and that much of that science is basically 200-year-old conventional wisdom, which perpetuates 200-year-old injustice. And I'm um, learning about this in working for the past few years with the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior, which is also at Harvard Law School. Um, and some of these assumptions are things like the assumption in the legal system that inconsistent memories are assumed false when talking about, for instance, credible fear in an asylum case, which does not stand up to the test of memory science. Things like eyewitness testimony as gold standard evidence, the idea that juveniles can be incorrigible, even though about 60% of them stop committing crimes after age 25, um, or the idea that mental injury is less severe than physical injury, which is written into the law and tort law. And these are questions for science. So neurodevelopmentally, when does the brain become an adult brain for sentencing 18 year olds? Um, for the science of trauma, how does childhood trauma affect decision making later in life? For the science of memory, how does acute trauma affect eyewitness testimony and thinking about racial bias specifically? Is it really a gold standard? And then thinking about brain imaging, does solitary confinement cause brain damage? And so right now I'm working on what's called an amicus brief, writing for a federal judge about whether uh, solitary confinement causes brain damage and thus is an eighth amendment violation. Um, and I'll say that this is not rare. Um, 10 to 12 of all US murder cases and 25% of death penalty trials feature uh, neurological evidence. Um, but importantly, a lot of this is not great evidence. So for instance, here's no lie MRI, which is quite literally a lie detector using MRI. And there's also many tests for uh, chronic pain. So this is a, a space where scientists need to chime in on good science and on pseudoscience. And I'm incredibly excited about CLBB, this Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior that I work with, um, because they're basically an uh, educational organization. So here are some of the presentations, um, the neurobiology of addiction, why is it not just say no as a judge, um, the impact of trauma on the brain and behavior. And um, CLBB is educating federal judges every year at Harvard Law, but also is heading two courts to help with individual cases. And here's one judge, Esther Salas, talking about um, in learning about neuroscience, I learned what it takes to understand trauma, talking about we have to understand the individual we're dealing with, how a traumatic history can change behavior, and not only sentencing in terms of mandatory sentencing, but also thinking about individual sentencing, pretrial, and post follow up with people. And CLBB is putting together a science of late adolescence resource library so that any judge in the country who has a 16 or a 17 year old in front of them and is deciding whether or not to consider juvenile life without parole can learn about things like executive development and the frontal cortex, immaturity, traumatic childhoods, drug addiction and their influence on behavior and whether they should or shouldn't be mitigating factors and whether they should or shouldn't think that that juvenile is literally incorrigible for life and can never, never be rehabilitated, um, which the science suggests is not true. So for the scientists here, um, I wanna say that amicus briefs to a federal judge can change federal law, that white papers, if you change one judge's opinion, like Esther Salas, literally save lives, that the experiments you choose to do are being used when memory scientists are compiling the science of memory to talk about traumatic memory in the courts and decide whether a fear is credible for an asylum case, your research is being used and that brain science is really a justice issue. This is new for me as a brain science student. I, I have not thought that I had any relevance to the criminal justice system and I have felt powerless to change it. The last five years have really shifted that for me. And for the educators in the room, I'm wondering where the Khan Academy is for judges, pretrial and probation officers. If we have a justice system, which is built around memory science, which is built around the, the science of trauma, neurodevelopment, um, but judges are expected to Google papers and figure them out for themselves. We can do better than that. And we can create a better justice system by educating better around brain science. Um, I wanna say that CLBB is uh, run by some amazing people, um, uh, Judy and Francis and Judge Nancy Gertner and Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, who I'm sure many of you know, Robert Kinsher, Sildewal Spitzer and Bruce Price. 
Um, and I really encourage you, if you're anywhere near the brain sciences or just want to support, check out clbb.org. Um, they need as many scientists as they can get to write these white papers up for judges, pretrial, and probation officers. And thank you so much for listening.